<laughs> All right, thanks very much. Um, welcome. Uh, this talk is, is uh, a bit fuzzier than uh, many of my other talks, uh, somewhat speculative, so it's sort of a, a midway uh, in uh, progress in exploring this area. And so uh, I can think of this as kind of the beginning of a conversation or a very much work in progress. Um, uh, it began for me a couple of years ago when I uh, started looking into deep learning and, and was really profoundly disturbed by what I saw. Uh, and uh, so, um, so I, I put some effort into thinking about you know, what, what, uh, what I thought was the essence of deep learning and, uh, and how we might do better, uh, hopefully much better than what we see up there. And so that, that's the goal. Uh, I want to I wanna find what, what is really the, the essence, the heart of uh, what's going on in deep learning, and then, uh, and then try to capture that heart and, and uh, I give it a, a much simpler, a much more powerful foundation to build on. Uh, and so in the process, I want to look at what are some of the uh, complexities in, uh, in the current uh, common practices in deep learning and, and how we might uh, eliminate those or replace them with something simpler and more powerful. Okay? So this is a, this is a very brief discussion I'll, uh, description. I'll come back to it um, in, in pieces so you don't need to kind of hold on to this forever. But this, this is a, a ca kind of capsule summary of what I think the essence of uh, deep learning is, and namely that it's about function optimization. Okay. So optimization, not like compiler optimization, more like mathematical optimization, meaning you know finding mins and maxes of functions. Okay. So we have a uh, we have some collection and an objective function that, that uh, evaluates this uh, collection of values, and we want to find the best element uh, in some set. Now, in uh, in some settings, we have uh, <coughs> we have uh, collections that are described by a continuously varying parameter. Okay. And in such a case, we uh, we can find we can look for a minima or maxima using gradient descent, gradient descent. Now, I'm going to be a little more honest in that. Gradient descent only gives you local minima, uh, and, and so that, that's not a strict match. But for some reason, that seems to be uh, enough for the deep learning people. That's a point I don't really hear discussed. <laughs> Personally, I don't quite understand, uh, and we can come back to. Okay. So uh, on the one hand, it, it's just about function optimization. But if we get a little you know uh, closer look at more details of machine learning. There's a particular kind of um, particular kind of uh, sets of values, which are sets of functions. Uh, so we're, we're looking for uh, functions in a, in a, uh, a big class of functions, and in particular, uh, we're looking for some such function in a family that uh, approximates as closely as possible a collection of data that we have. Okay? So that'll be supervised learning. We have a collection of input-output pairs, and we're looking for some function that comes close to uh, matching. <clears throat> now, first I want to talk about the, the, the shedding aspect. Why do I think that the current uh, deep learning uh, involves and teaches uh, that is not really essential? And, I, and the short answer is, <coughs> is everything, <laughs> or almost everything. Okay. <coughs> so these are the aspects of deep learning that I think are, are, are uh, both unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily complex and also limiting the expressiveness. Uh, and so one is, well, the popular choice of using imperative programming. So you, you, know, you might be working in, uh, in uh, Python or, or something like that. Uh, another is weak typing. You see in systems like uh, TensorFlow, for instance. Uh, and I think you know, we would all probably here, or most of us here, would agree with the first two items, at least the first one. Uh, and then the third, and more to the heart of, of uh, the, the field of deep learning uh, currently, but I hope not in the future, is that it's focused on graphs, and in particular what's called neural networks bunch of varieties of neural networks. Um, and, and so what I want to point out here is just the idea of networks and the meaning of you know, graph structure. Uh, and so you've probably, if you have any exposure at all to, um, to machine learning, you've probably heard about neural networks and seen them described as graphs. And I, I'm going to suggest, and I'll come back to later, uh, that these graphs are, are unnecessarily complex um, and an unnecessary period. Okay. And then in deep learning, we'll talk about what's deep is that there are several layers Okay, so you, you've got some kind of uh, uh, some computations that happen in layers, uh, passing on information from one to the next. And so uh, this notion of layers, I think, is also an unnecessary complexity. I'm just going to kind of um, I'm going to actually move faster through these, and I'll have slides that go into each of them in detail. Okay, so another is this notion of tensors. Okay, now if if you work in deep learning, I hope uh, I hope you're a, a little bit upset at this point because. As far as I can tell, deep learning as a field is kind of defined in terms of graphs and tensors as if that's, that's like what we want to accomplish. And I think those are actually both bad ideas. And both <laughs> okay. And now there's back propagation. Oh dear. Another kind of, you know, foundational axiom in the field, perhaps, uh, the way Eric talked about. Um, uh, and then another's a very strong uh, bias toward linear. 
the last year, this uh, idea of hyperparameters and then uh, manual differentiation. We have to talk about is uh, automatic differentiation, but in fact, these systems have quite a lot of manual differentiation. Okay, so um, imperative programming, you know, I, I think if you're here, you probably don't really even need to see this slide. Uh, imperative programming is, if we care about correctness, then that's not really a good uh, uh, street to go down. If we care about efficiency, well, these days, efficiency is really about parallelism, right? Clock rates aren't going, uh, going up very fast anymore, uh, so uh, we get speed by parallelism. And, uh, imperative uh, programming and parallelism aren't, aren't that great a match. Okay, and then, um, what, uh, it, well, we know, you know, theoretically and now in practice that uh, imperative programming is not necessary for expression. We, we don't lose any expressive power. And then, if you just look at deep learning, you know, as, uh, with the nature of what's going on, you know, as being uh, a function optimization, uh, imperative programming is, is, is a poor fit because the nature of the problem really is very mathematical. So, we might want to use a mathematical oriented language. Okay, weak typing, just the usual issues with weak typing. All right, so let's talk about graphs. <laughs> so not all systems, but, but many deep learning systems uh, uh, give a graph-oriented API. And then if you're reading about uh, deep learning, you probably are reading about graphs. And, and so in particular, any kind of graph-oriented uh, graph system like TensorFlow, for instance, uh, most of the API is about graph manipulation. Whereas the problem has nothing to do with graphs. The problem is about function optimization. It's about functions graphs. Uh, and, uh, and so we end up having you know, quite a large uh, API for something that's really beside the point. And we already have a better way to, um, uh, well, so what is the purpose of these graphs? It's really to describe the functions. Right? So these graphs describe functions. Uh, but we already have a much better way to talk about functions, which is functional programming. So in a pair of lines, okay, maybe you want to construct a computation. But uh, from a functional perspective, uh, we have a much better, uh, simpler, more well-defined tool. And that's our language itself. Now, there's a gotcha. If we're going to use something like gradient descent, we're going to need to differentiate. And can we differentiate our programs? Well, mostly not. If you took something like you know, the Haskell language and, uh, and a standard compiler like GHC, uh, you wouldn't be able to do differentiation. And in fact, it, it, it is, uh, differentiation is non-computable. Computable function is not computable to differentiate it. And so I think that's probably one of the motivations for, uh, for graph-like representations, is it gives something that one can like, uh, look at and examine uh, and, and treat, in a sense, symbolically. But there are better ways. Uh, the differentiation is, is a, uh, it's an implementation issue. Right? It's, not, it's not an expressiveness issue. Uh, and in fact, one can differentiate uh, a language like Haskell directly. And, uh, and that was the topic of my paper last year, Simple Essence of uh, Automatic Differentiation at ICFP. So, what about this notion of layers? What, what was kind of the, the wonderful progress that d deep learning made over the original kind of perceptrons um, seed uh, it, it is exactly the depth having these multiple layers. But, uh, but in fact, the, the um, deep learning focuses on this depth. It, 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 makes, it makes sequential composition into like the, the structuring uh, mechanism. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are other equally important forms of uh, what program combination there are. There fundamental building blocks besides sequential composition. And one of them is parallel composition, and another is sequential, which is sort of like a, uh, describing a function by cases. Okay. So that these are like three equally important uh, forms. And if we canonize one of them as, as the kind of uh, current practice that deep learning does, which is sequential composition, then everything that you want to do not, that's non-sequential becomes awkward. And so you see papers that uh, introduce uh, innovations like uh, what skip connections and, ResNet and HighwayNet are, are examples of that. Uh, but these are like solutions to a problem that was unnecessary in the first place, right? So if, if, if you make sequential composition the organizing principle, then whenever you want something that isn't strictly sequential, you have to kind of add this ability. And rather than adding a solution, um, my recommendation is that we remove the problem in the first place and simply don't, uh, don't focus on sequential uh, composition. So instead, have, have a much more uh, symmetric and balanced approach, which is we have, yes, sequential composition, which is one building block, but so is parallel composition, and so is conditional composition, okay? All right, so what about tensors, all right? Uh, I remember reading on Quora a while back, somebody claiming that uh, uh, Haskell is unsuitable for doing machine learning, for doing deep learning in particular, uh, for a variety of reasons. One is because, you know, nobody would really want to program functionally. But another one is, is that it doesn't have a good tensor library. 
and so, but what I want to suggest is that, is that tensors are really not the right approach, and we already have a much better approach. So, when deep learning folks say tensors, they, I think they, they don't really mean tensors, they really mean multidimensional arrays, okay? And we've already been in an era where we could only program with multidimensional arrays, right? Scalars, multidimensional arrays, and that was Fortran. That was all we had, and it was better than nothing, but it wasn't really a very convenient way to uh, structure our, our data and uh, structure our programs. Okay. Uh, also, when you program with arrays, right, you're doing index calculations in your programs, and those indices can be, uh, well, they're a source of complexity, uh, so they obscure the program, and they also can be wrong. Uh, it's a source of type errors that, that's hard to detect uh, statically, automatically, and of course, you know, we'd like to get as much correctness uh, checking as we can out of our compiler. And so, of course, well, that's fine to just throw in dependent types. Uh, but that's a rather complex and heavyweight uh, uh, solution. And it still doesn't address the <coughs> problems that array learning programming uh, introduce, which are, uh, they're non-modular. It's not very, you know, very compositional notion. It, uh, it obscures the uh, beautiful structure of an algorithm that becomes apparent uh, when you can talk about <coughs> uh, more natural data types like trees, for instance. Okay. Um, what? Oh yeah, uh, and, and when you have to encode a natural representation into uh, uh, one that's imposed on you, for instance, arrays, um, the, the arrays become a kind of form of weak typing, right? It, it's like all I have, to, it's all I have uh, to use. I really have something in mind, but I have to use this representation. So the representation doesn't really capture my intent. It's something that, that you know, I have an intent in mind I have to tr translate it into. And even if you think about arrays, uh, sorry, matrices, you think about two-dimensional arrays that are intended to represent linear transformations, matrices. I used to uh, work in computer graphics, uh, Microsoft Research a long time ago, and I remember that there were, it seemed about half of the people wanted to multiply, the, wanted, and then when they did matrix, ve uh, matrix vector multiplication, they wanted to put the matrices on the left and the vectors on the right, and about half of them wanted to do it the other way around, right? And so if you have a square matrix, which was usually the case, uh, Four by four, quite often, uh, there was like no type checker that, that you know was going to catch this mistake. If, if you treated uh, the thing as if, if the array is on <coughs> if the array is on one side of uh, the vector, then, then you want to be talking about uh, you're thinking of uh, the rows as vectors and the other case, you're of the columns as vectors, right? There's nothing in the, in the type in your program uh, that that distinguishes between them. So even for something as simple as matrices, uh, arrays are an ambiguous uh, and therefore a kind of uh, what error inviting representation. Okay. And then another aspect of tensors is that, is that it's just uh, terribly weak. There are a whole lot of uh, differentiable types that are not, um, well, there are a whole lot of differentiable types that are not vectors in the sense of not uh, uh, uniform in tuples. And the linear transformation for all of them are not naturally represented uh, in a, a, matri a matrix form. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> If, if we stick with tensors, we're missing a whole lot of, of interesting natural uh, differentiable types. Okay. All right. Now, what about backpropagation? Um, <clears throat> so, backpropagation solves a particular problem, which is uh, differentiation. Okay. If you have a function from uh, from the, uh, a vector space to its own scalar field, okay, uh, you you could differentiate that, and with just a little bit of tweaking or a, different perspective, you have what's called a gradient, and that tells you what direction to, uh, gives you the, uh, uh, what steepest descent, you know, or it's negative, tells you the steepest descent, right? Okay, so that's the nature of the problem, and there was a field called, there is a field called automatic differentiation, and they worked out methods for doing this, and then the machine learning folks uh, rediscovered um, essentially the same algorithm, <coughs> and uh, I think they're the ones, I think, who call it backpropagation. Uh, the AD folks call it reverse mode automatic differentiation, and the AD community and the machine learning community, so AD, automatic differentiation, both of those communities define the, the problem in terms of graphs. They talk about here's a graph structure, now, which, which denotes a function. How do we compute its derivative? <coughs> and that approach will lead you to a complex algorithm. And the entire literature that I've seen, anyway, in uh, uh, automatic differentiation is extremely complex. And the reason it's complex is that graphs are not a suitable, um, um, if you want to understand differentiation, uh, then differentiation is not compositional with respect to graphs. Okay? So it's, it's a poor fit for the problem being solved. 
Uh, you can, in fact, people do. It's a heroic effort, and there are very long and complex papers uh, about how to, how to uh, do reverse mode, in particular, automatic differentiation. But the complexity in it, I believe, is due to the, to the choice of graph structure. And, uh, and I think I've demonstrated this last year in my paper, Simple Essence of Automatic Differentiation, which is just they forget about graphs and use a, a, a more what, mathematically natural and universal uh, way to look at the problem, which happens to be category theory, but that's not important. Uh, and the problem becomes extremely simple. Okay? Now, one of the problems with backpropagation is that because the graph formulation, uh, the algorithms are stateful. Uh, and that statefulness uh, means that it's difficult to parallelize. It means it's, of course, a source of complexity and bugs. Uh, and that is, uh, it's unnecessary. It doesn't have to be. So, all right. A neural network, <coughs> usually, it is, is some sort of assembly, perhaps, you know, a very simple linear composition of, uh, of linear transformations punctuated by, by simple nonlinear transformations. Okay. So what you may have heard is a fully connected neural network, for instance is a sequential composition in which each phase is, is an arbitrary linear transformation, a matrix, if you will, okay? Followed by, and, and that matrix is completely learnable. You, know, you start off like not knowing anything about it. That's what we want to learn. And then in between, we need to have some form of nonlinearity, okay? And the nonlinearity is of a very restricted form, and it's completely nonlearnable. It'll be something like a, a ReLU or a sigmoid. So it's it, so aside from the graph nature and the sequential nature, there's a very high uh, bias toward linearity. In fact, everything that kind of in, in, these, um, in a neural network that's learnable is linear, and, and, and the linearity by far you know, dominates uh, what's going on in the computation. And I think and this is where I, I'm not I'm not as confident in some of the other things I'm saying, and, and really you know hoping to get uh, feedback, particularly from machine learning folks. With having such a restricted class of functions, that the, we need to have, uh, uh, what is it? The functions that we're learning, I think, need to be larger, more complex, in order to accommodate for how restrictive the class of functions that we're, that we're uh, searching is. So in other words, if we have more flexibility, if we allow ourselves more flexibility in the computations that we're trying to learn, the shapes of the functions that we're trying to learn, then I believe we can learn uh, smaller uh, function with smaller descriptions, okay, uh, which means we can do faster training and faster execution. This bit's a bit speculative. All right, this is. Uh, I hope machine learning people are embarrassed about this. Uh, <laughs> people, there's parameters of things we want to learn. This is this is kind of automatic search using gradient search, and then there's hyperparameter, which is all of the other aspects that that, that one might vary, which is like the. The, what, the, the depth of your neural network, the widths, um, even some you know, choice of architecture. These are all like uh, hyperparameters. And all that means is, yes, they're exactly another degree of freedom, like the things that you're automatically learning, but you don't get to learn them automatically. You have to learn them manually, which means you get to execute the search. All right? And, and just you and I aren't very good at executing you know, these kinds of uh, computations. <laughs> and so it becomes like a, a very ad hoc, messy, time-consuming aspect of the field. Although it's, it's really ex for exactly the same purpose as all of the parameters, all the other degrees of freedom. Okay. All right. So there's my criticism. <laughs> uh, and now I want to suggest uh, hopefully something constructive, which is where we might go from here. Uh, and what I want to suggest is everything that I described is unnecessary complexity. Let's eliminate that from deep learning. And what do we have left? Kind of a general intent or something like that that we all kind of learn. <laughs> and I think really the essence of what all of that other crap that was getting at was trying to get at. So these are the values that I that I want to apply. Um, if you have different values, you might disagree with some of these directions. For instance, if you want to make Python programmers happy, all right, then if that's one of your values, then you probably will come to different conclusions uh, from mine. But these are my values. So. I would, I would like what we replace the current state of the art with, to be precise, I mean really like semantically precise, we know exactly what things mean. Why? Well, so we can, uh, we understand, we can reason about, which just means understand with you know, a little more clarity, yeah, and we get correctness. All right, I also want it to be simple. Why? Because, uh, well, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it, uh, it's beautiful, it's more satisfying, more enjoyable, but also if it's simple, we get more insight. Because we have very limited mental abilities, 
And so we can spend our abilities dealing with complex APIs and, and you know, ad hoc sets of rules and, and, and long lists of exceptions and so on, or we can apply our limited abilities to understanding and investigating the, the kind of things that we you know, really want to uh, explore and discover and accomplish. So, and then generality. Well, generality uh, gives us room to grow, and it also gives us a kind of design guidance. And so what I mean is if we can try to align what we're doing with general principles, so like maybe mathematics that was discovered 500 years ago, you know, something like that, or mathematics that's proved quite useful since the maybe middle of the 20th century, for instance, category theory and functional programming. Uh, then there is what we're kind of stepping into the Tao, right? We're stepping into the flow of progress, uh, and um, what particularly if we build on uh, what mathematicians have discovered, and functional programmers who are in a sense, you know, uh, share the aesthetics of, of mathematicians, uh, then we will get some kind of guidance. It's a kind of a feedback. If, if I'm inventing something wonky nobody ever invented before, I could be quite proud of it. Aren't I clever? On the other hand, well. If I'm reusing, you know, some deep properties, or if I'm seeing that my problem is really kind of a special case of some deep things that you know people have, have discovered and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, what discovered some hard one uh, generality and beauty, uh, then it's likely that my design, although I might not be as proud of myself, right, in a sort of um, I know egocentric way, but I might be more confident that uh, that I am moving in the, in the direction of. Uh, success not only in accomplishing what I already am trying to do, but what I might try to do in the future. Okay. This is more of a philosophical point. All right, so again, uh, this is what I think the essence of uh, deep learning is, which is just optimization. I've, I've, got a, I've got a set of values, and each of those values is, uh, is sort of graded by an objective function. That's just a function from that value to something like the reals, any kind of totally ordered set. And I want to find the best such element according to that, uh, that way of measuring it. And quite often, uh, the way that, that, that uh, a, a useful tool in looking for uh, best elements is gradient descent. And that's useful for when my, what set of elements is described by a function. It's the range of some function. Okay. So a function you think of as an index set. The, the, the values come, uh, are in the codomain and the indices are, are the domain. It's just, just kind of another way to think about functions. So I said best element of set, another way to say that is, it is, the, is the maximum or minimum uh, value uh, 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 of a function. Now, for machine learning in particular, the set that the values that we have that we're you know, exploring and, and trading off against each other are functions. Okay. So we have a set of functions. Right. And then what's our objective function? Well, uh, it, it, in supervised learning, we have a collection of data pairs, input, output. Right domain and codomain. And the objective function is, you give me a function, and I will, I will take each of my pairs of values, input outputs, and I will see how well that function predicts them. So I'll apply the function to the input of, uh, of one pair. Uh, I'll compare the result with the output. And then, and then I take something like the, uh, the sum of the squares of the er errors, sum of the squares of the differences. Okay. So that's just kind of a standard uh, uh, way to think about objective functions on, uh, well, it's a way to think about uh, supervised learning. Okay. So optimization, kind of in general, but more specific optimization or sets of functions. Okay. Now, here's a, a little more precise way to think about it, is that our, our sets of uh, values, see, oh, there we go, okay. So these, these, these are the sets of values, um, these are the values C, and I'm gonna represent the set of values as a function from P to C, and that set of values is simply the range of that function, right? So all, all the C values that you can reach from, you know, if you could find, whoops, uh, the right p value. There we go. Okay. So we have a function from p to c, and we have an objective function that, that grades each of, the, each of these c values, so c to r. And you can see if we just compose those two functions, q and c, now we have a function from p to r. Okay. So the c's are, are the kind of, these will be like the, uh, the functions that we're trying to discover. All right. The p is the, the indices, or really the parameters, that's why I call it p. And then how are we going to uh, grade them with this Q? All right. So when we compose Q and F, we get a function from P to R. And now we want to find the minimum achievable value of that function. That's what R min is. Right. So that, I think, is, is the, the, the kind of the, a simple general description of, of function optimization. 
And then, of course, there are a variety of, of ways to uh, implement argmin or, you know, to accomplish it. And in particular, when, when this function that we're, whose, oops, whose argmin we are, there we go, is differentiable, then use its derivative, use its gradient, gradient descent. Okay? Otherwise, use other methods. And I think this is a really important point <coughs> because, um, uh, because I think what we really want to do is, is, is not just gradient descent, but a hybrid search where we have some, uh, some discrete and some continuous. Because some non-differentiable and some differentiable, and the non-differentiable will in will uh, what subsume what we now think of as hyperparameters. Right? So there is one unified search problem that includes the hyperparameters and includes the parameters, uh, and maybe we will still end up manually uh, searching through the hyperparameters, but I don't think we should settle for that. I'm not really going to mention that anymore, and just now focus on the differentiable aspect. All right, there we go. So now, more specifically, in the case of supervised learning, uh, are, are uh, the values that we're you know we're looking for the, the, the best ones of are functions. Okay, so I'm just specializing the previous slide. So now we have a function f that takes a p to a to b. Okay, so the reason I've written it this way with the parentheses is just to emphasize that that we're going to be searching for values of p, looking for optimal values of p, and what I mean by optimal is they give it the, the best. A or B, the best function is A to B. I want to be the best. That's the objective function Q. Okay. All right. And we have a sample set, just a bunch of sample data, which which is a set of A cross B pairs. Okay, the same A, B. And the point, uh, the, our objective function measures the mispredictions. Thank you. Okay, so it's sometimes a loss function. This is a technical, not very important step, but the nature of this objective function is that it's additive. So, so we have a sum of contributions from each data pair. If we care about efficiency, which I care about, and, and in particular, you want machine learning is one of the reasons that, that machine learning is so successful is, uh, is because we have <coughs> a lot of computational power. Uh, then the additive nature of this objective function allows us to do uh, long time what is it? Log time evaluation of the subjective function. Log parallel time, I should say. It's kind of an ideal time. All right. Now, uh, so so I just told you what I think the essence of, uh, of, of deep learning is. Now, here is a, a kind of vision of differential functional programming. Uh, you may have heard that term recently, or, or just differential programming. Uh, and so the particular form that I want to recommend is, uh, is I'm going to say Haskell here, but you can substitute you know whatever pure functional language you want, or whatever pure functional subset you know of a language you want. So so when I say Haskell, translate it to your favorite functional language. All right. So rather than having uh, rather than having these what neural networks or any kind of graphs, we just have <coughs> functional programs. Okay. So uh, so the idea is just write Haskell programs. There's no API. Just do your functional programming. Okay. So, not, so it's not a library I'm talking about. Okay, if we use this technique, we're going to evolve some reusable idioms, and we're going to share them with each other, and so some sort of library will, will evolve. But it's not like a graph library. It doesn't give you any fundamental functionality. The fundamental functionality simply comes from the functional programming language and the ability to differentiate it. Okay. So no graphs, no networks, no layers. All right. Differentiation could be that at compile time or runtime. So if, for example, I believe PyTorch is a system which is sort of aligned with this idea. Rather than writing uh, Python code that generates, that explicitly builds graphs, you just write Python code that executes. And through some you know, quite clever implementation, uh, uh, um, what uh, differentiation is done at a runtime. I think probably <coughs> it builds a graph, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so it's all that at runtime. But we could do it at compile time instead, and that's what I would recommend. And moreover, we can do it in a very simple way. Do it, what's the it is differentiation. Okay. So you write a Haskell program. Now to do this sort of search, right, to find that what, what is, so your Haskell program is going to be a current function. Right, it's going to get a P to an A to a B. All right. And then you compose it with the objective function that measures the, the A to Bs. Right, and now we get this function that we're going to want to minimize. Okay. And so that's why we want to differentiate this, uh, this Haskell program, which is the composition uh, of your family of functions and the objective <coughs> function, the loss function. All right. <coughs> So we can differentiate Haskell programs, I showed this last year, in a very simple principle in quite a uh, general way. Uh, to me, it's it it quite a surprise how general uh, this turned out to be. And we can do it at compile time. That means we can, uh, don't have to waste uh, 
runtime. At runtime, we're doing these differentiations, and moreover, um, uh, therefore, we can afford quite a lot of time to optimize. Right. And generate efficient runtime code. And when I say efficient runtime code, I don't mean a CPU. Yes, of course, you could run on a CPU, and you want, if you are going to run on a CPU, it will be efficient. But these days, efficiency doesn't come from CPUs. Right? Relatively speaking, <coughs> it comes from things like GPUs and FPGAs and uh, analog photonic computers and you know whatever sort of esoteric wonderful things people are coming up uh, with now, largely thanks to the machine learning revolution. All right, now, what about tensors, all right? So, okay, you could, great. Uh, you, you, you could say, let's just program in Haskell directly, but of course you need tensors, because machine learning is about tensors, but you know, I've already told you it's really not about tensors. <coughs> it's about differentiable things. Okay. So it's about vector spaces, or more generally, it's about manifolds, but, but just for simplicity, we'll focus on vector spaces. So. So uh, what does it mean for a type to even have the right kind of uh, what shape or nature? Uh, I'm trying to say. If we have functions, you have some function from A to B, and you'd like it to be differentiable. Well, there are certain restrictions on the function. I mean, it's to, to be differentiable, it can't be you know, uh, arbitrarily wacky. But there are really some restrictions on A and B itself, on the domain and codomain, for the notion of differentiation to even be meaningful. And so, uh, so one general way to think about it in terms of uh, is in terms of vector spaces. So we have vectors, and we have linear transformations. So this is linear algebra. Now, if you took a very kind of applied uh, class in linear algebra, or, or you learned it in a very applied context, you might think that linear algebra is about matrices, about matrix 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 multiplication, and matrix vector multiplication, and uh, transposition, and you know all these things that are about uh, uh, matrices and, uh, and vectors. But that's on the so that's if you had a kind of very applied uh, linear algebra class. If you had more of an abstract linear algebra class, you'd know that there are axioms. <coughs> the definition of a uh, vector space is, is is axiomatic. So there is some abstract notion of a vector in this vector space, and, and there's an abstract notion of linearity, right, which involves uh, addition and scaling. So that's that's the more kind of general abstract uh, setting of linear algebra. And linear algebra is is essential. To, uh, to gradient-based optimization because <coughs> derivatives are linear transformations. Okay. So you might think a derivative of some function is like uh, a number or a vector or a covector or a matrix, but all those uh, those forms are just representations of one notion, which is linear transformation. Okay. So we need a notion of vector spaces, and I'm going to suggest let's have a much more generous notion uh, than we're given now that leads us to tensors. And, and one way to think about that is this idea of a free vector space. Okay. So if you have a scalar field S, right, this would be the reals. You can just think of S as the reals. All right. Then, then any vector space over the reals is a function. Okay. So I'm saying a vector is a function uh, from some type I to S. Okay. So this is the scalar field, a scalar field. So what what does that mean that a, a vector is a function? Well. Um, if you think of, a, of a, 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 like a three vector, R3, okay, then you know there are three places you can index that vector. And when you index into any one of those three places, you get a real. Okay? So if you think of those indices, that's I. Okay? And what, what is the type I? It's going to be some type that has three values in it. Okay? So let's call that fin3, fin sub 3. That, that's kind of a standard name for a finite uh, set of, of cardinality 3. Type for kind of cardinality three. Okay, so that's the idea: is, is that I indexes into uh, into the vector. Now, uh, a variety of reasons why, mainly for performance reasons, but we would rather not use functions. Okay, uh, and and so it, um, there's there's an alternative, an isomorphic representation of functions, which is their memoized form. So uh, for functions over a wide variety of domains, uh, there's a lovely way to think about memoization, and it's based on uh, function type isomorphisms. And all you really need to know is, is that for some domain types, memoized form, or the data structure that contains all the information of the function, okay, uh, uh, you can memoize functions into a certain class of functors. Technically, for those functors is representable. The representable functors. And they're basically functors whose shape is determined by their type. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, as a very special case, uh, if we have functions from fin in, so that's going to be uh, to s, that is an n vector. Okay. So, this is r to the n. Okay. 
But uh, there's a really nice algebra which we can build up. These represent both functors, because we have products of functors and compositions of functors, and then their identities. And if you know anything about like uh, generic or polytypic programming, uh, which we've been playing with a lot in Haskell, uh, you might know that that there's a wide variety of data types. You might write your own functors, your own structure that you that you like to organize your information into, and we can automatically <coughs> encode that into this standard vocabulary and decode it out. So if we know how to work with the standard vocabulary. We actually know how to work with a wide variety of, of, uh, of shapes that are natural uh, to your program. So what's the point here? The point here is that in functional programming, with the type functional programming, we've discovered some really nice ways to structure data in corresponding ways to structure programs. And so uh, I don't want to send us back to the Fortran age where we have to deal with arrays, but allow us to use our lovely compositional um, uh, vocabulary for, uh, for data structures. And then once we have these uh, vectors that are represented by this in functor form, which is just a memoized function, right? <laughs> these are the, the, the kind of free vectors. So this means a linear map. So a linear transformation from, from an, an f vector to a g vector okay, can be represented simply by the composition of functors g and f. So this is something you see over and over, which is a matrix is a vector of vectors. Okay, that's exactly, so this is just the generalized form. So this is a more general way to think about linear transformations, but don't think about linear transformations as this, because, it's, because this is just one representation of linear transformations. It's more general than uh, matrices. But there are a lot of representations of vectors. And in fact, particularly, uh, one of them, which is not uh, a kind of matrix or generalization of matrix, gives you very simple reverse mode automatic differentiation, in other words, uh, uh, back propagation. Okay? So I just want to say there are nicer, more general ways to think uh, about data than tensors that still fit into differentiable programming. Okay? But they don't even get quite you know, too attached to them. Uh, so, Use your own lovely representation to program and differentiate it, okay? but still don't quite identify that with the notion of, a, of what a linear transformation is, so keep it abstract. Now we have a nice collection of, uh, of, of abstractions and functionality that allow us to manipulate data, transpose things, you know, traverse things, and so many folds and on. Now we get to use all of these building blocks, right? all of our lovely functional programming building blocks for manipulating our generalized tensors. Okay. Moreover, there they're compositional in lovely ways, and that composition leads to lovely uh, parallel implementations. And, uh, this is a pointer to a paper I had here two years ago on generic parallel functional programming, which is about exactly this kind of a, a data types for general parallel programming. All right, Let's see, I think I'm gonna skip that. All righty, so uh, running out of time, and I, I really do wanna leave time for questions. Uh, where am, am I in this investigation? Well, I have uh, a simple, efficient uh, way to do back propagation, reverse mode AD more general than back propagation. Uh, I've done some simple experiments, so we have like what's called uh, like fully connected neural networks, um, but I mean, they don't look like neural networks, they look like lovely Haskell programs, uh, and a convolution of neural networks. And, um, uh, I ran, I've had some implementation success, ran into some implementation challenges uh, with robustness. Uh, this all works on top of a GHC plugin uh, that I talked about a couple years ago called Compiling to Categories. And that, that, that's what enables uh, Haskell programs to be differentiated, is some, uh, reinterpreting them in a, in a, slow, um, in a more informative setting uh, that is a kind of augmented functions so that their uh, differentiation becomes uh, possible. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay. So, so I've made a little bit of progress, uh, practical progress, uh, pursuing this direction. And I'm looking for collaborators, uh, particularly people who know something about GHC internals, give me some uh, feedback. Uh, and some help as well. And then also just, um, I don't you know, have much of a background in machine learning and statistics, and you know, machine learning is probably what about statistics. Okay, so in summary, uh, I'm suggesting that we simplify and generalize, vastly simplify and vastly generalize uh, the, uh, deep learning, where we get a lot more for a lot less. Uh, and that, that the essence of deep learning is really just pure functional programming with this min arc, with the ability to minimize and then an important part of how we do that is to it involves differentiability. Okay. And that we generalize from tensors into something that's a lot more um, what, uh, generous in letting us program in, in uh, compositional type safe ways. Uh, and, uh, and that I'm uh, very interested in collaborators, people who are inspired by this vision and, and uh, would like to play. And uh, I'd be happy to take questions now.
So the question is, uh, uh, what can I say some more about my mm, my remarks that the current methods are sort of hostile to parallel execution? Yeah. Um, given that there, there's some good success uh, in keeping like GPU cores busy, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm saying is, is uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, there are sources of parallelism that, that are, you know, exist in current practices. I would like to allow much more parallelism, and in particular, uh, in the, uh, the differentiation aspect. Okay. So uh, now we have what, uh, you know, a few cores on a CPU, uh, hundreds or I don't know, more to thousands yet on a GPU. Uh, a few years ago, I was working with uh, dynamically reprogrammable FPGA-like architecture, where you know we're pushing more like a million. Uh, and I, I think we're just going to keep moving toward more and more uh, available parallelism. And so I would like to have all forms of uh, parallelism. I'd like to not offer any unnecessary obstacles to parallel evaluation. Okay. Uh, it's more of a remark than a question. So the people who compile TensorFlow have made many of the same observations as Good. you. Because the internal representation before going to the back end is a pure functional language. That operates on tensors, of course, yeah. statically typed. Yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so underneath, even TensorFlow, underneath it, they realize that it's a pure functional thing. They even represent it that way, and yet they give uh, their users this yeah, the, unnatural the, interface. Yes, yeah. the user level is crap. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I visited Google, and I and I definitely picked up on that sentiment that people were noticing this graph stuff was uh, not that great a fit. Uh, yeah. uh, so I don't know if you've, if you've seen a, a series of blog articles. Cool. What was the name again? Justin Lee. Oh, Justin. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I don't know you, and it's also written the uh, black publication by Green Haskell as well. Yeah. And yeah. I was yeah. Uh, what thoughts you had on, on his his views? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so Justin Lee, and he's not the only one. There 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 are mission, what, deep learning and back propagation. You know, kinds of uh, libraries showing up in the Haskell world. But all the ones I've seen have this property that they are sort of DSLs. Um, that they uh, are. Um, what, there's a very kind of strong graph-like nature in several of them, and I think Justin's is that kind of thing. There's, there's just like you can build these things and you put them together and you talk about the widths uh, of things and, uh, and and there's like new, new numerical indexing. So I think it's still very kind of um, uh, graph-oriented in its uh, thinking and also kind of array-oriented in its thinking. So um, I think it's a kind of progress, but not necessarily pointing in the direction I'd like to point in. One of the motivations for the work seems to be to allow um, uh, use of more interesting functions than are typically supported by TensorFlow. So you have fully connected, you have Relu, Leaky, Relu, Max Paul. Like if you look at the, the general layer structures used yeah. by these libraries, it's the same basic structure. Yeah, it's not much there. Do you have examples of other interesting layer structures ah, that great. can okay. implement, but cannot be implemented in great, these other ones? Yeah, uh, I do not. Okay, so the, the question is, uh, do I have examples of, uh, of uh, what we could do if we uh, threw off the shackles of, of the kind of very limited uh, fixed, uh, not fixed, that's a bit of an overstatement, but it's not much more flexible than fixed, yeah. Uh, no, I don't. No, I think that's something that uh, I'd like to give us all the ability to explore and play with. So, I mean, I, I think we we'll probably have a hunch. I think part of what I'm saying is, is, is that there's no such thing as deep learning programming. Yeah, there's no such thing as neural net programming. I mean, there is, but I'm suggesting a world in which there isn't. There's just functional programming. So if I gave you the opportunity to describe, you know, you've got some interesting thing that you're curious about, you're wanting a model, but all the code that you write has to be in this discipline of, you know, linear transformations and slightly nonlinear things, right? You wouldn't like to do it. So we've explored a lot of, uh, of programming styles, and I'd like us to be able to apply those even when we don't want to do some learning. So can I ask a follow-up question? If you just design interesting layer structures, I, wouldn't you be worried about making the, the, the optimization structure a lot less smooth so that now you don't have any chance of converging to it? Oh, okay, okay. So um, what is it? Uh, even, if, even if the function that we describe is differentiable, if we allow ourselves the kind of uh, what freedom of expression that we're used to, maybe we'll find ourselves in like such bumpy terrains that uh, that what either I don't know gradient descent doesn't work, or it leads us to things that are uh, to local minima that are nowhere close to uh, like a global minimum. Um, I don't know, but 
but let's find out. Okay. So yeah. you, uh, when you think about these function spaces, uh, the, the, one of the miracles of machine learning is perhaps to avoid overfitting. Yep. Uh, yeah, with, the, with this choice of very special functions, they eliminate that with regularization and so on. Do you have a hunch what that picture is in a more general perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> All right, so, so the question is, um, it has to do with uh, overfitting, which is a uh, it's this technical thing that comes up in a kind of current practice of machine learning. Uh, if, if I have a lot of degrees of freedom, uh, if, my, if my function space that I'm searching is very large, it has a lot of degrees of freedom, then I can come quite close to the data uh, by being just sort of terribly waggly. It, it's like uh, if you have a bunch of points and, and you want to interpolate with a polynomial, you get to choose as high degree of polynomial as you want. Well, just choose the degree of polynomial that's about equal to the number of points. But you don't really learn anything from it. You've just found a way to kind of pass through all these points. Uh, so there's a there are a variety of techniques uh, uh, called regularization. That, that attempts to uh, pull you back toward uh, what simpler, less wiggly, less noisy uh, approximations. And what I would suggest is that I, as a general alternative, not saying I know this works, but this is what I would try first, it is to instead make the simplicity of the function be part of the objective function. Okay? So we have a whole big space of objective functions, uh, sorry, of, of candidate functions, and I want to find ones that come very close to fitting the data, but also are simple, not complex. And so that, that's, that, that's kind of the direction that I would explore. And, and regularization might turn out to be a, a kind of a special case, you know, something like that. But uh, more generally, um, I think that that's the approach that I would investigate in. So I'm afraid we're, uh, we're yeah. maybe one more question, but then we're out of time. Okay, you, you choose the questioner. Yosef? Yeah, so the representable functors are really nice. But not everything can be described or efficiently described by a representable function. So I just wonder whether you explore going outside of that. Yeah, okay. So um, so is, is representable functors too restrictive? Um, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. And, and I, I don't think I know what, what kind of differentiable types you think cannot be expressed as representable functors. Because what I'm really saying is that this general notion of free vector spaces, and maybe you're saying free vector spaces isn't, isn't uh, adequate itself, and uh, representable functors is just, just a memoized version of those. Um, the yeah, well, there, there are certain things that can be implemented that way, but that turn out to, you, you are penalized by right? uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so I think you're bringing up something that's very important that I forgot to mention, which, which is what I want us to be able to do is, is use our wonderful vocabulary for for, uh, for data types with you know, all, all its lovely abilities and, and uh, uh, laws and, and so on, um, but I don't want us to pay for it. Okay. So I want to give us the, the, the uh, expressive freedom and the soundness and composability, all right, but still uh, accelerate these things at least as fast as current systems do. Uh, and so. Uh, so I, th I think it's very important to be able to program with these data, natural data types, but to compile them into array code. Okay, so if I'm going to be running on a GPU, GPUs are array oriented. I don't want to be following pointers, right, on this GPU. Uh, and a, a nice thing about uh, representable vectors or, or free vector spaces, as long as it's they're finite dimensional, they're always isomorphic to arrays, to one dimensional arrays. Yeah. So I have a scheme I talk about it. It's this kind of work in progress. Uh, for taking all of these uh, lovely functors that we know how to, to work with and we enjoy working with and compiling them into array code. And in doing so, it's going to want to generate the index and the indexing is going to be you know, provably correct by construction. So, so, so one reason for programming with arrays is you want efficiency. But we don't have to use the same abstractions, uh, we don't have to use the same notions that we uh, choose for efficiency uh, in our programming model. In a particular, representable functors and arrays, uh, there's a kind of a nice, simple, sound way to move between them automatically. So anyway, I think that's probably the last question, but uh, I'll be around happy to talk with you. So thank you very much. I guess.